When it comes to video game icons, there's one that we are all more than familiar with, Sonic the Hedgehog. And for around 30 years now, one studio has been grinding away on creating new entries in the Sonic series for the world to enjoy. Mmm, sometimes. While the employees of Sonic Team have come and gone over the years, to a lot of people, this logo is very emblematic of nebulous folk who bring us those games. But sometimes between Sonic titles, Sonic Team works on new, original properties because trust me, working on one specific thing for years begins to get old and sometimes you just want to make a game about futuristic firefighters or mice who can pilot rockets. And while a lot of Sonic fans are at least generally familiar with Sonic Team's non-Sonic output, there is one title that seems to have been forgotten by everyone. 2004's Astro Boy, yes developed by Sonic Team. Yeah, not gonna lie, for the longest time, I didn't even know it existed. I never saw anyone talk about this thing, so I figured today I would shine a spotlight on it and see what it's all about. Also, for as unfortunately knowledgeable as I am about Sonic Team games, I actually don't really know anything about Astro Boy, other than I wish he'd put on a shirt and stop looking at my wife like that. That aside, whenever a soft reboot of a long-running series comes out, and the title is just the name of the series all plain and simple-like, more often than not, that's a great chance for a newcomer to jump in and see what the franchise is really all about. So while I don't know much about Astro Boy, I can tell you that this is a licensed tie-in game made to accompany the 2003 anime reboot. I hear that Astro Boy fans generally tend to like it. There was also another Astro Boy tie-in game released by Sega during this time, the much more well-known Astro Boy Omega Factor for the Game Boy Advance. When you hear about Astro Boy video games, that one is the one you always hear about. It's supposed to be pretty good, uh, let me know if you've played it. Alright, enough YouTube factual preamble, uh, let's pop the game in and see what we've got on our hands here. And the game kicks open with Sega and Sonic Team logos sharing real estate. Nice. And then it immediately reminds you that it is a licensed tie-in game by just showing the intro to the anime wholesale before popping its title screen. One thing I do like about this is that they got a few different characters from the show to say Astro Boy, so when you start the game up, you'll hear a different voice sometimes. I'm a sucker for games that just cheesily say the name of the game on the title screen, and when Astro Boy himself does it, he'll do this super cheesy, Astro Boy, that's me! It's dumb, but I like dumb. Okay, so we start a new game and get another scene that I presume is just from the show, where Astro Boy is being created, but uh-oh, a pipe came loose. Uh, it's okay, he has it under control. Yeah, it, it went fine, okay. Once the scene concludes with Astro being given his name, uh, Astro, we jump to the in-game graphics and are just standing in some room as a robot talks at us in text that I can't help but wish went faster. It tells Astro that he's been alive for 40 days? Just to review, I want to go over the basics of life. Whoa, 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 whoa. 40 days in and we're already going over the basics of life? This is a huge topic to start the game with. I, I just wanted to fly around as the weird little shirtless boy and... Oh, phew. okay, much better. From there, Nora, the robot, uh, basically just tells us the button inputs, which is never the best way to learn how to play a game. After escaping the room and antagonizing birds, some robots show up and demand that Tobio, Astro's original name, show them how strong he is. So from here, you punch them with the square button and defeat them. Except, uh-uh, there's one we didn't beat that pushes us off the building. <laughs> oh no, what will Astro Boy do? Well, that's easy. He'll suddenly have his stumpy little boots turned into jet engines and fly away, silly. You have gained rocket feet. <laughs> it has been eight minutes since I put this game into my PS2. And thus, the robot that pushed us off a roof is immediately forgotten as Dr. Light flies up to casually remark that Astro can fly while wondering what other powers he may have. He then asks Nora to set up... Five rings around the Ministry of Science. No, 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 no. You cannot start off a flying tutorial by asking the character to fly through rings. There, there were just rules to video game, and Superman 64 burned that bridge. I will not do this. Okay, I did this. Astro's flying controls feel all right. You control which direction you're going with the left stick, move up and down with the right stick, and use L2 and R2 to move your camera to the left and right. In confined areas, it isn't as great, which we'll get to, but in the vast open stretches of this city, it's fine enough, if not a bit slow. But that's where Astro's special faster move comes in, called 
the spin attack. Yes, one of Astro's first abilities in this game is coincidentally one of Sonic's. No, I have no idea if that's intentional or not. It almost feels like a bit of a misnomer. While flying, you'll hold the square button down and Astro will fly much more quickly. And that's the spin attack at its base. It takes some getting used to as once you're holding down square, your left analog stick kind of takes on the job of the right analog stick. You have to use it to control if you're going up and down or not, instead of just forward or backward. It also makes your turns much wider. Uh, it's strange. It has more purposes than just flying more quickly, but we'll get there. After flying through five rings, Starter Light suggests we go back home to talk to Zoran, who is Astro's sister. Back at home, Astro decides to stand like Michael Jackson. Talking to Zoran reveals that she's basically just here to serve the role of tracking collectibles. <laughs> Alright, Astro Boy surely locates some cool stuff in his adventures around this futuristic city. Uh, what's it gonna be? Collect cards? Oh, that's creative. Now, if you'll excuse me, I I'm feeling a bit peckish. I I'm gonna go step outside and try to find some eating food. Oh, that's convenient. Directly outside Astro's house, there's a vending machine. I'll just pick something from it. Or I can just pick it up. Uh, conveniently, there's a collect card under the vending machine that stored the eating food. I think I'll just throw it at this old lady. <laughs> Why, yes, it is fantastic that I can fly. I haven't been able to fully verify it myself, but supposedly this is the first game developed in Japan to use the Havoc physics engine, which, as we all know, Sonic Team would put to even better use just a couple years after this game. After stumbling about some, we unlock the power of super hearing and head to the city to track down Magnemite, who is attacking a bridge. No, not that Magnemite. It's here that we get our first real taste of how combat works in this game, as well as the game's structure. By using the L1 button to lock onto an enemy, you can hold down the square button to use the spin attack on an enemy, essentially serving as an automated homing attack. Oh, That takes a lot of the frustration out of trying to fly around and hit enemies. You essentially work through and use Astro's spin attack on each of these tentacle enemies, then yoink them out of the ground. Then you do the same to this spider, wasp, uh, robot boss, and a cutscene happens where Astro sucks all of its energy and the robot boss thanks him for it. Neat! Then you're told that Dr. Light is back home, and to head home. And spoilers, but this is basically how almost the entire game works. You're told of a situation, you go to that place, fight a boss, and then go back home until the game tells you about another boss. Here and there you'll come upon some actual areas to explore, and we'll get there. But this game is only about 4 hours long, so uh, yeah. So we return home, and Dr. Light is just sprawled out on the couch. Astro, you're alright! I was so worried! Bro, if you were so worried, why are you just hanging out here on the couch like it ain't no thing? So with our new supersonic hearing in tow, we're contacted concerning some jewelry store robberies in the city. Upon arriving at the scene, we have to pull some adventure game shenanigans and talk to specific people to progress the plot. Namely, Astro's cool kid friends and a detective who doesn't want Astro fiddling with the crime scene. A plot is then hatched by the three friends to take care of the detective. Namely, a plot where they run up to the detective and make him chase them away from the crime scene? I guess that works? With the detective gone, a small boy makes himself visible to Astro, and then turns invisible before you have to fumble about the area trying to find him. In the ever-growing sake of convenience, Astro unlocks X-ray vision in another one of these creepy cutscenes. With just the press of a shoulder button, you can find this kid with pretty much no problem in this area. X-ray vision drains the red meter in the top left of the screen, by the way, and as you may have noticed earlier, landing spin attacks on enemies does as well. You'll gain more points to use as well as more health each time you complete a story event in this game, and the bars do refill gradually over time after using them. Uh, you know, standard video game stuff. So from here, the goal is to use X-ray vision to lock onto the invisible kid, then use an actual lock-on mechanic to send to your camera on him, then awkwardly fly around this small shopping plaza while trying to grab onto his cape no capes. to stop him from escaping. This effectively results in a literal tug of war as you grapple with not only keeping the kid in your sight and grip, but also trying to balance out your red meter to wear him down as much as you can before your x-ray vision needs recharging. Not helping matters is that the frame rate seems to tank a bit in this area. I'm not sure why, as it should be much less demanding than the much larger city we were in earlier. But before we can ponder on that for too long, it's revealed that the kid, Denku, has a ticking time bomb strapped to his chest unbeknownst to him. So naturally this entails a repeat sequence where you have to chase this kid around again, except this time on a 3 minute time limit. Thankfully Astro successfully wears him down and yeets the EMP bomb toward the roof of the shopping plaza. Is that, is that okay? Shouldn't he have at least taken it out outside and thrown it at the sky? 
Oh well, it all seems to work out, and Denku isn't any worse for wear as Astro teaches him about how stealing is bad, okay? Side note, none of these characters appear in this game again, except maybe the detective? I, I honestly can't remember, so that's cool. So we return home and Dr. Light tells us that he somehow studied the EMP bomb that we blew up and he wasn't around for, and sees that it was built by using a Dr. Tenma's technology. Astro, as well as me, asks who Dr. Tenma is, but Dr. Light will only share that he is the man that tried to use Astro. For some reason, he says he cannot say any more about it, urging Astro to investigate what Denku is up to if he wants the answers. I am really not understanding why he can't just come out and say it, but alright. So we take the disguise around Metro City and find some robots that need punched. After a stern and informative punching, Astro stumbles into a building where Dr. Tenma informs him via hologram that he has prepared a gift for him, a test if you will, to see how strong he has become. The test is robot wasps, I I I'm not joking. It's just robot wasps. Before even processing any of this, Astro gains the digibeam ability that lets him fire a laser beam from his finger by using the circle button. I honestly didn't find much use for it in this game, but it does do a damn good job of slicing through robot wasps. Its other main use is for situationally cutting through doors, and is that the Project Shadow logo from Sonic Adventure 2? Huh. After leaving the building, we encounter, oh god, it's Shadow the Hedgehog on a motorcycle. Hell yes! His name is Atlas, and he is here to destroy the puppets of the human race. Nice and concise, that's what I like in a rival character. He's equipped with a pretty chill boss theme and beam lance. I was actually struggling on this fight for a few tries because he's pretty capable. Then I realized I could just grab these streetlights and bash them over his head, which pretty much entirely just breaks this fight. I can safely say that beating a robot over the head with a streetlight is a first for me in a video game. So we win and harm Atlas's arm, which he proclaims he'll make us pay for, before speeding off and offering no grander plot exposition. After resting overnight, Astro immediately steps outside and we use x-ray vision on a woman in front of his house. Trust me. That sounds weird, but the reality is even weirder. The game turns into, and I kid you not, a text-based RPG where you have to use battle commands to defeat the aura demon that is possessing her. I... I have no idea. Five of the most confusing minutes of my life pass, and the girl has no recollection of what happened after. As thanks, she hands over a... collect card, and that's that. We just walked outside our house, got into a psychic RPG fight, defeated an aura demon, and got a collect card. The card is of Denku, in case you were wondering, I, I know you weren't. Astro then heads back to the Ministry of Science and overhears a conversation between Dr. Light and Dr. Wily, thanks to his super hearing that I already forgot that he got, where Dr. Wily wants Mega Man back to help him do evil things or something, but there's no time to dwell on that. Robots have invaded the Bay Area! After clanking some robots together, Astro gains the ability to understand all spoken and written languages. I would be lying if I claimed to still have a coherent grasp of what is going on at this point. Dr. Tenma then asks Tobio to show him how strong he is, insinuating that he was behind the random robots from the start of the game. And then Astro... Uh, yeah, he, he beats the robots. These are really not noticeable fights at all. There's some light tension as you're trying to defeat these robots before they reach the building they're going toward, but... The fight is so easy that the tension deflates quickly. So we head back to Dr. Light, who tells us more about Dr. Tenma, and it's Mega Man. It's just Mega Man. Long story short, Dr. Tenma's robotic work eventually advanced to such a point that he began to believe it was humanity's destiny to be ruled by the superior robots and to make Astro Boy the king of them all, while Dr. Light believed that humanity and robots could live together in harmony, each helping the other with their flaws and strengths. Before we can think too deep on that though, we're interrupted to be told that Astro was just seen on the news destroying the city, so we head right on over to see what on earth that means because we're Astro, right? Upon getting there, we immediately tangle with doppelgangers of Astro, and the usual punch plus spin attack trick works as magic. Dr. Wily then appears again via hologram, urging Astro on and to keep evolving and reach his full potential. Astro responds by initiating another cutscene where he gains an arm cannon ability. Neat! And as it turns out, Astro isn't the only one with an arm cannon, as one of the doppelgangers reveals themselves to be Astral. Not gonna lie, at first I was sweating a bit. There were no grabbable streetlights anywhere in sight, so I wasn't sure how I was gonna manage this fight. 
but with some generous use of the arm cannon and some risky punches, I was able to top him. In fact, I killed him so hard that he questioned his existence and then fell down and then exploded right out of the entire plot. And say it with me. From here we return home, just to have someone appear via whirlwind outside of our house. Not content to leave Astro without a sub-boss for even a few minutes, Pluto has appeared and reveals he was created to become the most powerful robot in the world, challenging Astro before spinning off to the industrial area. Now, to break out of the plot recap whirlwind we've been trapped in for a bit, I won't lie. By this point in the game, my investment has waned. I think the combat is mostly serviceable and it does seem to be the main draw. The general plot here at least does a decent enough job of keeping things moving also, but it alongside the lack of any real motivation or even locations to explore begins to creep in around this point. Just for reference, we are approaching two thirds of the way through the game and all we've really done are fight a few bosses, erase Shadow the Hedgehog from existence, and pull on a kid's cape. I could fly around the city and see if there are any more zany side quests like that weird RPG battle, but there's no motivation if all I'm getting out of it is a 3D model to look at and an urge to scratch my head. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that Astral was a particularly interesting character in any way, but it feels like a waste to just kill him off and immediately bring in another character to fill his role. I'm sure this is probably due to roughly following the story arc of the show, but if that is the case then it does a disservice to this game in my eyes. Again, being generous, this is a decent game, kind of mediocre so far really, but Astral being a dumb rival was probably the most interesting thing to happen so far for me. <laughs> hey, me from the future here. So to completely undermine my point, I had already entirely written out and voiced the last paragraph or so where I called Atlas Astral the entire time. So uh, hey, you've already written your comment correcting me, so uh, how are you doing? Thanks for sticking around. Anyway, back to the plot. We arrive back at the industrial area, and Pluto pretty much just says he has no purpose other than to be Astro to prove that he is the strongest robot. Yep, it sure is. To his credit, he puts up a pretty decent attempt. The aim of this fight is to dodge his missiles and up close attacks to land some punch combos in, and then throw him Super Mario 64 style into nearby buildings. Thankfully, the streetlights are still very effective here. When Astro puts Pluto on the ropes, Dr. Jester shows up and urges him to realize his destiny by finishing off Pluto. Pluto doesn't understand why Astro is sparing him, but before Astro can answer him, Pluto gets impaled by a Pluto look-alike as a mysterious hooded figure descends and tells Dr. Wily that he will handle it, citing that Astro isn't fit to be the king of the robots after all. Also, credit to Pluto, before he dies, he rips into his own chest and pulls out his own heart to give to Astro. Jesus! This new Pluto handily deflects Astro's spin attack, and instead of killing Astro and finishing the job, the hooded figure tells him that he's prepared somewhere else for him to die. Dr. Wily finally accepts that Astro is not his son, and as a final gift unlocks his full potential. This manifests in him unlocking the strength of 1 million horsepower, as opposed to the 100,000 horsepower Astro previously had. Yeah, sure, thanks guy, roll the cutscene. Uh, just please don't tell my wife he's been working out. Thank you. Our next stop is the Brocken Volcano, which is actually a constructed environment with multiple rooms! By god, it's a proper dungeon! In my Astro Boy game! My excitement for the variety in this game was very quickly dampened by the reality I was facing though. I worked through a corridor and used the digibeam to blow away some rock to uncover a door, and as I went through the door, I found a nice open volcano area and searched around to find the room to the next area. I then had to do a double take because it looked like the exact inverse of the room I just went through. I nervously went through it and upon reaching the end of this new corridor, I used the digibeam to blow away some rock to uncover a door, which led to a nice open volcano area. I, I then proceeded to search around to find the next area. That led to what looked like the exact inverse of the room I just went through. If it wasn't for the varying enemy placement, I would legitimately have thought I messed this up and was retracing my steps, but no! This is literally the design of this area! They basically created two or three environments and reused them repeatedly, only mildly swapping out various parts, item placements, and enemy placements. And called it a day! I almost would rather them have just used each of the pieces once, at least then it would have felt much less confusing. And to spoil the surprise here a bit, this is basically the penultimate area of the game if we discount the final boss mission. Like, I, I really wish I had anything constructive or interesting to say about this area, but it's just so milquetoast that I'm drawing a blank. 
The visual variety is nice, I guess. I mean, most of this game has been taking place in areas around the city, so getting out of it is a pleasant change of pace. I'm inclined to make a meme about how this place reminds me of Flame Core from Sonic 06, but I've already invoked that game a few different times now. So anyway, after about 10 minutes of futzing through these similar hallways, we find the Hooded Man and the Pluto look-alike, called Archeron. He goes on about how Astro's emotions make him weak, and how Archeron has no emotions as a liability, and evil laugh blah blah blah. That, essentially, Archeron is a cold-blooded killing machine, and a lot of his moveset is taken straight from Pluto's. He still utilizes up-close swiping punches and launches missile barrages on occasion. He also uses his whirlwind spin to try to draw Astro in closer. However, this is the first fight in the game that seems to aim to make you think a bit on your feet. A lot of the Arena's 4 is covered in lava, and eventually Archeron will summon these magma pillars. So carelessly using Astro's spin attack, we'll risk sending him careening into one of these surfaces as he zips around. The pillars do go away, eventually, and that opens you up to try calculated attacks to wear him down. Again, I won't say this game's combat is anything too great, but I do think this boss fight does a good job of challenging any bad habits he might have fallen into, and making you more aware of what you're doing with the mindless techniques at your disposal. It's actually kind of fun! After some thoughtful pummeling, we make Archeron go boom, which makes the figure remark that there just might be some who are strong even with emotions. Then he laughs, then he just flies away and says nothing more. Alright, so it's at this point that I comb through my recorded footage to make sure I hadn't missed any backstory. And I don't think I did as far as the main missions go, but this game just casually drops that this character's name is Shadow at this point. So as any sane human being does on a Saturday night, I went to the Astro Boy wiki and found out that he's a robot scientist created by Dr. Tenma. That would have been good to know. Uh, again, maybe that information is locked off to a side mission, but it seems like it's pretty important to know. It kind of makes me feel a bit for Dr. Tenma here. I, I glossed over it earlier, but he created Astro in the image of his dead son. And for Astro and Shadow to both be creations of his that have betrayed him, hey, that's gotta stink. Unfortunately, I don't really feel I can give the game credit for this, since it seems to stem from the anime specifically. Going back on track, we're told that a witness saw Shadow going toward a building, so we follow his trail. Upon arrival, we find another larger scale area to contend with, the Eagle Building. This is basically another set of combat hallways and rooms that all look nearly identical aside from their enemy placement. It's kind of a bummer, since the place just looks bland. The enemies are interesting to deal with, and we even see some more robot wasps, but it doesn't take much effort to blow through this building. It took me about 15 minutes, but that's only because I legitimately got kind of lost, because it all looks so similar. It turns out halfway through, I'd accidentally disoriented myself flying around during a fight, and went all the way back to the start of the mission. There's at least a bit of a mix-up at the end, though. You don't fight a boss. Instead, you just have to fly through some hallways before 16 doors close and try to lock you in. As it turns out, Shadow was somehow secretly building a gigantic missile drill thing underground and is now launching it into outer space and is about to build his perfect robot world or something. So from here we go to the Ministry of Science and Dr. Light just casually shoots us into outer space as all of our friends cheer us on. I guess I was wrong earlier, Denku does technically show up again. We have to beat up a few robots who are just casually hanging out in space because I, I guess they were in the way or something. But alas, the drill missile thing is in sight! But then a new character named Blue Knight on a galloping horse in outer space approaches Astro and I... <sighs> yeah, another robot who wants to be free of a so-called human reign over robots. Again, I get that this is technically derivative of an anime, so part of the fault may be on me for not watching the show, but it would have been nice to at least had some of these characters alluded to more strongly beforehand. I guess this is to make up for not having a boss at the Ego Building? I don't know. Blue Knight tries to make an emboldened plea toward Astro, but he's cut off and immediately accepts that they must fight. At least they don't waste any of your time here. Part of my annoyance with this character stems from his fight being somewhat troublesome at first. It takes place in an open area with no interference, it's just a true one-on-one -on -one encounter. But if you fly too far away from him, he sends out what seems to be a near unavoidable energy blast that does a considerable amount of damage. Then you can swoop in and land about three spin attacks before he launches another energy blast. The trick that worked for me is that you have to stay somewhat close to him and basically just hold the analog stick to circle around without much gap between you and him. This makes that energy attack miss much more often. It took me longer to figure that out than it should have probably 
probably. Once his health is depleted, a second phase starts up where you need to widen that gap as he starts using a charging attack. Once you've dodged him, you have time to get about 3 spin attacks in before he puts a force field up and swipes at you. After some of this, he gets desperate and starts trying to slice Astro with a flaming sword attack. The timing to counter attack at this point gets trickier and to be honest, I mostly only made it through with luck. Uh, good thing I did too because when you die in the second phase, you have to start all over again. So we teach Blue Knight about love and Shadow kills him because no boss robot is allowed to learn from their errors and live in this game apparently, so going through, I was initially a little confused at this point. Shadow removes his hood and I thought Dr. Wily had pulled a fast one and was actually the secret bad guy all along, but I guess he just made Shadow in his own image? Which makes the name make much more sense in retrospect. Anyway, he aims the drill missile ship thing at Earth and... Oh, this looks very familiar. So yeah, just like with the Bio Lizard, we have to stop this ship that's on a collision course with planet Earth. On paper, this is the coolest part of the game, and once you know what to do, it is. Basically, this drill has multiple parts on it that you have to attack and wear down within this 8 minute time limit. The missile is constantly launching defensive projectiles at you from the rear end of it, and if you spend too much time back there, it'll fire off some lasers that can take off about a fifth of your entire health bar. So at first, I took the wrong message from these defensive measures and thought that it meant I shouldn't use my arm cannon since it keeps you stationary and makes you an easy target. So I tried to spin attack everything. It worked well enough for these three main drill parts, but left me constantly timing out as I tried to focus spin attacks on the parts that shoot out the defensive projectiles here. As it turns out, you want to spin attack toward these things to get in close, and far enough ahead of where the lasers shoot out, then use your arm cannon to destroy them one by one. With that taken care of, the homing projectile stops shooting out, and then you can focus on destroying the entire unit from behind. <laughs> I timed over about 6 different times before I realized this because I kept getting so close to doing it with just spin attacks. Needless to say, it was much more fun once I realized how to effectively use the arm cannon here. With the drill missile ship thing successfully destroyed, and with no one questioning what happens when the debris hits Earth anyway, Shadow asks Astro why he fights his own kind to protect humans. Astro hits him with a single simple statement, as Shadow reveals his Dr. Wily head was just a hologram, while telling Astro humans will betray him as he gets exploded out of the plot. That happens a lot in this game, but it doesn't happen again, as we have reached the end of this adventure. Astro closes out the game by answering that he may end up regretting his actions someday, but he wants to live side by side with humans anyway. Then he flies off, summoning the credits. And that's it! That's Astro Boy for the PlayStation 2. If you feel underwhelmed, or even just whelmed, then yeah, we, we feel the same. I came into this as a Sonic Team fan, of course, so my read on it will be colder than an Astro Boy fan's for sure, but it didn't really exhibit any quality of their games that I enjoyed from this time period. When first hearing about a Sonic Team Astro Boy game, I imagined I'd be in for a score attack focused game that honed in on being a shorter, but replayable experience. A game that had a cool, kinetic energy to it that would be far from perfect, but at least interesting with an attempt of neatly designed environments to promote flying around with interesting and varied approaches. Love them or hate them, the Sonic Adventure titles were designed in a way like that. Instead, what I got was a series of combat environments where the flying seems to be here from necessity, rather than integrated into the game design properly. It's kind of fun to just aimlessly fly around between missions, but that's the thing. It's aimless and can only entertain for so long. The combat is awkward as well. Punching in general feels off. The three hit combo tends to overextend, so you're either in a situation where the enemy is on the move and you're missing due to that, or the enemy is stationary and your hits start to miss because Astro moves so much during the combo. Again, some of the fights were surprisingly fun within the confine of the game's domain, but it was pleasant at best and dull at worst. And it's hard to really rag on a licensed game's story, but the way it routinely introduces a character and then does nothing with them was a small element on top of a stack of disappointing attributes. And it isn't too surprising, this game meets the usual quality of a 2000s licensed game for sure. I just found myself hoping for a bit more going into it. The visuals pale in comparison to even Sonic Team's other output from this time, and the soundtrack is serviceable throughout. It's an inoffensive game that you beat and forget about a week later. I just found myself hoping for a bit more going into it, especially since the press release mentioned that folks who helped work on Res and Space Channel 5 were involved. Those are iconic games. 
Oh, and Sonic Heroes 2, I guess. But on the bright side, by sticking through to the end, we're now both more knowledgeable about one of Sonic Team's forgotten projects. There are a couple more titles that no one knows about, but those are Japan only, so it makes sense as to why no one has heard about them. So what say you? Have you played this game before? If you're a fan of the 2003 anime, does it more or less capture the vibe of it, or let it down? Did you eat breakfast today? Let me know in the comments, and if you want to see more videos about Sega games, or just cool games in general, consider subscribing so you don't miss out. I just might make a video about a certain Sonic game that turns 10 years old soon. Either way, thanks for dropping by. I've gotta go beg for my wife back now. My patrons helped make this video possible. If you want your name here, consider tossing a buck my way on my Patreon. A special shout out to Goldstorm07, Buckles Chucklow, Jeet, Calico Plus, The Crazy Even, The Legend of Groose, Patrick Thompson, Svendelica, Wolf Chaosan, and Joey for pitching in. Thank you.